I'm Lance Felchuk for Arrow in the Heads the Black Sheep, where we discuss and defend the genre's most divisive films. William Friedkin has had one hell of a storied career, from winning an Oscar for The French Connection, creating one of the most famous horror films ever with The Exorcist, to the sports film Blue Chips with good old Nick Nolte. I'm through fighting, you sons of bitches! You're the dumbest king I ever coached! Hell, he was even a part of bringing back Matthew McConaughey with his brilliant performance in Killer Joe. Friedkin is all over the place, but damn it if he doesn't make an entertaining movie. Let's be honest, how do you top The Exorcist? Easy. You don't. Can you catch lightning in a bottle twice? It's best to take your win, your achievement in the genre, and leave on a high note. Have them wanting more. Be a Costanza. Now, of course, if you're a professional storyteller and there is a story worth telling, then f it. Fight the odds and do what you believe to be right. Uh, since Freakin's filmography is as random and eclectic as a 70s Bowie, it should be no surprise that as much as he thought he was out, they pull me back in. And grace the silver screen with this month's Black Sheep entry. The weird, wild, and slightly ridiculous. 1990's The Guardian. After a long absence in the genre, The Guardian should have been a return to form. Now, I do want to give credit to Friedkin for the underrated masterpiece Rampage, made a few years earlier. A serial killer flick that is a commentary on the death penalty and the criminally insane, which I consider a horror movie, which also scared the living shit out of me when I was six years old. Yeah, different times. But The Guardian failed to catch on with audiences with Siskel and Ebert tearing it apart as one of the worst movies of the year. Now, as much as I love them and everything they've stood for, my local guys had this one wrong. So I will do what must be done and defend this mangled yet entertaining movie. More akin to something like Warlock, The Guardian is first and foremost a fantasy film. Now, I didn't have the luxury of the warm blanket and nostalgia to guide me through, but my love and appreciation comes from the odd and interesting choices that went into this. The Guardian is horror, technically, but puts its foot firmly in the fantasy subgenre, only more dark and gritty. I mean, read the opening crawl like this, and you see what I mean. For thousands of years, a religious order known as the Druids worshipped trees. I mean, it's not my best, but you get the point. Camilla, played perfectly by the stoic and beautiful Jenny Seagrove, is a hamadryad from a druid cult. By these runes, transform us. Ah, almost right. That is a part of and protects an ancient tree that needs the blood of babies to survive. Camilla has been doing this for what I assume to be centuries, and our next victims are a Chicago transplant family who recently moved to LA. Now, there are some gorgeous shots that establish her cohabitation with said mystical tree, and it's these scenes where you can appreciate Friedkin's eye. It almost doesn't fit in the movie because it has such an otherworldly touch. Can't you see Atreyu talking to this giant fucking tree? I mean, even the way the tree moves, the way it's lit, surrounded by wolf guardians. Even how Camilla flies at the end, oh, spoilers, but it is 30 years old, has the look and feel of a different genre. I'm not ragging on this either. I think The Guardian's biggest asset is the fantasy lore mixed with a 90s thriller and a Sam Raimi level of gore. Who, coincidentally, was supposed to direct The Guardian, but passed to make his very own superhero movie with the amazing Darkman. What ties everything together and helps sell the absurd is Jenny Seagrove. Playing an entity that is mimicking human behavior is a fine line to walk, as it could become ridiculous. But she nails it. She's seductive, yet has a soulless stare. These little details and movements can probably be attributed to her training at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. Phil and Kate Sterling, played by Dwyer Brown and Carrie Lowell, are fine as the yuppie couple. Dwyer's a decent lead and, and plays the hero here, but besides some great overacting, Why are you doing this? Let her do the talking! What do you say, Camilla? Or is it Diana? Diana Julian? And a fun scene where he shows Camilla what happens when you fuck with his son. You take your hands off my baby. <laughs> Dwyer just kind of comes off a bit flat. 
I mean, nothing terrible, but I was hoping we'd have a, a more engaging lead to face off against the amazing Seagrove. Now, the biggest tragedy is that Kate is severely underused. As a Bond girl, in one of my favorite Bond films, it's a shame to see Carrie Lowell just sort of around. But since this is infamous for a shit ton of rewrites, it is possible that her character ended up as collateral damage. In case you didn't know, Friedkin and his ego basically had the screenwriter, Stephen Volk, rewrite this script so many times the poor guy had a nervous breakdown. This whole project started off closer to the book, which had supernatural elements, but more of a hand that rocks a cradle with a century old woman. And over the course of all the rewrites, we came to the druid tree demon witch lady thing. And I ain't complaining. Life is short. Let's, let's get weird here. Word on the street has it that Volk wanted to keep this close to the source material, while Friedkin, by extension of Universal, wanted more of that sweet exorcist money and pushed for a more supernatural take. This, and supposedly he was reading a lot about druids. I don't want normal. Let's go more fantasy horror, please. The gore in this is surprisingly over the top, with a random gang meeting a bloody end by the tree after attempting to rape Camilla. Yeah, that actually happened. Now, I can't show you much because of YouTube, but uh, here's a taste. <laughs> Friedkin doesn't hold back, and the gore alone makes it a must-see. Since this was late 80s, early 90s, the tree was a magnificent practical effect. Sadly, the original effects team got fired. Because the script changed so many times, the tree became more important, more of a focal point. We get the greatest ending of all time, Chainsaw vs. Tree. Beautiful, really. Maybe Universal pushed the director into more of the supernatural, but it's clear Friedkin didn't phone it in. He purposely made a crazy and entertaining story that forgoes any subtlety and embraces an in-your-face approach. Now, it's not all cheesy and campy. There is some genuine tension. With the Guardian Wolves, I mean, I think that's what they are, helping out Camilla Beastmaster style. Even Camilla at her true form. Not sure what stage she's at here, but it's unsettling looking like a cave woman trying to snatch a baby. This may have disappointed audience members and critics that wanted more of an exorcist feel, but time heals all wounds. And like the true champions they are, Shell Factory came in for the win, putting out a great Blu-ray back in 2016. People may have wanted Escape from New York, but they got Escape from LA instead. View this in that light, and you can see a lot of the wild fantasy ideas bloom, only skewed more towards the absurd. Just because it didn't work as planned, doesn't mean it didn't work at all. <laughs>